Hello and welcome to Talking Really and today we're going to talk about my senior school years following on from my previous episode when I was talking about my uh, early life. So age 10 um, I have to go to London with my family and we go up to London to the Spastic Society headquarters which is uh, Obviously, the charity now called Scope because spastic has, as a word, has um, connotations that are um, deemed to be offensive. So if you hear anybody calling anybody else a spastic, then just remind them that it's not polite to be calling somebody that. In actual fact, the word spastic just means tense or tight. Uh, So you have spasticity. It's a form of muscle problem that means that your muscles are not working properly and that they are tight. And this obviously leads, leads to the fact that you cannot move your limbs. So spasticity is just one form of cerebral palsy. Cerebral palsy has four or five different types. Uh, they're a, a special unit on their own with, uh, uh, what, de- deform- deformities? someone that hasn't got quite all its faculties in some way or another, either speech or limb or something. Well, um, it's a person that's deformed. Um, well, I've heard that they're doing quite a lot for them. They have funds and what have you, you know. Um, actually, I think we've got a box at work for them. It's a child that's either mentally handicapped or physically handicapped, isn't it? Spastics? Well, it's a... But poor old chap that's, uh, you know, got spastics. But he's mild, maltreated, is he? <laughs> it's difficult to sort of assess the advantages that they would gain from the physical treatment here, but one of the things that we aim to do is to prevent deformities. And it isn't possible to assess this, the value of this, because one would need to see that same child so many years without receiving attention or physiotherapy etc and comparing it with itself having received it Uh, and and they can all be in combination with each other so that you can actually have a multi disability within the term of cerebral palsy Uh, my particular one uh, version if you like my version is uh, Aphetoid, aphetoid. I went to London for this educational assessment and at uh, age 10, I didn't know a lot. Um, I had been taught by obviously this uh, headmistress called Miss Ram and uh, obviously the, the school where I was was, was very good at learning uh, for and teaching for uh, disabled people and it was actually a world leader now um, and, still, and it's still there. Uh, so if you haven't watched my previous uh, video, you can find it up the top. Um, it's well worth just having a little look at that because it does go into, into detail about uh, my early life. In the 70s, there wasn't much choice for education. You, if you had a disability, there you weren't really um, put into mainstream schools. Uh, you were you were put into a um, special education uh, system, and the choices were uh, for me to to go to a boarding school where you uh, where it was residential, so you stayed there for a term and then came home at holidays if you were lucky. Some people didn't go home. Some people had to uh, stay there because they lived too far away. Such as um, there was a couple from Scotland, for example, and they were they couldn't pop home for half term, so they had to stay in school. So I had this. Uh, this test, this educational test, and I was deemed to be suitable to go to this uh, school called Thomas Delarue. Uh, it's not there at the mo- It's not there anymore because it was actually demolished uh, in the eighties, and uh, a big um, gated housing association thing was was built. Um, I've been back several times to have a look, and it is basically just a, a gated community with very large houses. So somebody made some money out of that. Um, incidentally, the headmaster when I was there was Mr. Mayhew. Uh, Mayhew was um, related to the MP that used to be in Parliament. Uh, he was a nice enough chap, very tall, I do remember, um, and very fair in, in his decisions.
So I can remember the first day that I went to, to school. We had a we had a four hour drive down to down to Kent, uh, the family and all of my stuff. And I was sort of not really very happy about going, but there was nothing I could do about it. I had to go. Um, I remember pulling up to this big building. We had we had been there to have a look around before. I don't really, really recall what that was like. I just think, oh my god, this is, yeah, whatever. And um, but on the day of actually going there, it was a bit different. I do, do sort of feel a bit sort of butterflies in my stomach. Um, and it was even more difficult when uh, the time came for my family to leave. I was there. I was. We had we had a wander round. We had a look round with the staff members. We've been introduced into. Um, you know, my 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 house mistress, who was called Hattie, uh, Miss Atkinson, she was uh, um, my house house mistress, looking after our our dormitory, um, and I'd been set up in my bed, I had my uh, stuff unpacked, and uh, was all ready to go. So I was the, basically one of the first people to arrive on on the in, induction day. Uh, the difficulty was knowing your way around because it was such a huge place that you know, it took me a while to get used to where things were. Um, and, and the um, actual bedroom area was a long way from the main um, building, so you had a pretty long walk to go down there. And at the time, I wasn't really walking that well, so um, it was moderately difficult to, to, to get around. Uh, there were obviously uh, lots of things to learn, uh, and um, I, I explored the um, sort of venue, as it were, after my family had gone. And of course, that was quite traumatic seeing them pull away, um, knowing that you wouldn't see them a again for at least three months. Um, that there was no likelihood that you would go home uh, any time sooner. So, so you're stood on on the um, outside balcony and uh, waving them bye bye as they turn off down down the main road down, heading for home, uh, another four hour journey. Uh, we lived in Bristol at the time, so it was quite a long way to go down to Tobridge in Kent from Bristol, um, you know, and um, it was one of many journeys that we made over the years. So I can remember the first day thinking, oh my God, I'm on my own now. What do I do? Luckily for me, I kept myself busy because um, I know that other people were were arriving and age 11, it's, it's quite traumatic to be dumped in a place that you don't know with people that you don't know and <laughs> you've never done it before. So I, I sort of befriended somebody um, who was, was in tears, basically, because they they've been dumped and um, you know I sort of um, adopted this guy who, who I tried to console uh, as best I could because I knew that it would help me um, in the in the long run I, I sort of felt a bit better about myself being on my own keeping myself occupied of course we had to wait quite a long time for for meals because they were at set times of the day and I believe that, if I remember rightly, tea time was 6 p.m. So we had to wait for them when we arrived, sort of 2 o'clock-ish, until 6. So there was not a lot to do. I mean, we could wander around and sort of... It was a TV where we could go into, or we could go into our room and sit there. Um, but essentially, there was nothing really to do, because people were still arriving. Um, I know that some of the more able people came... And, and obviously the people that were already attending, some of them came on the train uh, and um, in taxi and things like this. And later on, uh, in my school years, we had a, a minibus provided by the Bristol City Council to take us from the uh, home to the school. Um, so we were actually very independent and uh, del delivered there by um, minibus. Uh, in actual fact, there was a couple of people from Bristol who, who went to the school, um, obviously because they came to my school, Claremont. Um, my my, my so-called best friend there was um, Barry, who 
who came up with me and we were sort of um i think we were put in the different classes if i remember rightly we were in different um streams um because they had educationally assessed us to be uh like i i was actually there um i didn't know it at the time but i was there to do o levels so i was in one of the uh sort of streams that were teaching o level uh subject matter i mean i can remember the first few days first few weeks were traumatic because i i really was finding my feet i had a lot to learn i i got lost on the first day i didn't know where my my classroom was and um you know it was quite difficult to get around and of course we had lunch time i think was was about 12 30 um breakfast was i think was eight to eight eight or eight thirty something like that it was um usually about an hour or so and then we started school uh on the weekdays on the weekend saturday and sunday was our own time um so so some of the more able people who had been assessed by uh, the physiotherapist could could go down to the town Tombridge and they were allowed to use the buses and uh, go shopping and things like that that happened for me later on in my in my school years that we were assessed to be able to go and I would go down to the town on a Saturday afternoon and do a bit of shopping buy some chocolate or whatever and when I was a teenager um, I used to buy some beer and go into the park and and Tunbridge had a castle. Uh, we used to go in there and sit up there and, and sort of have a little can of beer. Um, Newcastle Brown was my first um, beer and it sort of stuck with me because I do like um, Newcastle Brown. I mean, even in the 70s, the mid 70s, it was quite unusual to see uh, disabled people wandering about, but not in this town because this town was actually, the school was um, two or three miles up the road. So the town was actually quite used to seeing lots of wheelchairs and people with walking difficulties. There was a football stadium just in, in the middle of town that we used to go to to watch the football. Uh, I wasn't really a football fan, but it, it's for, I went a couple of times and uh, uh, I don't, didn't, don't remember much about it. I just remember it's bloody cold, <laughs> freezing, and uh, I couldn't wait to get back to the school. So educationally, I did O-levels and uh, I didn't really enjoy the school life. I really felt it very um, draining, as it were, because I didn't really enjoy doing learning at the time. I, I felt like, as a teenager, I really could do without it. And uh, Some of the teachers weren't that good. Um, we used to have uh, history lessons and it was just a case of, copying down everything off of the board and the guy was moderately old and had pretty poor sight so he would have this board blackboard uh, uh, with four or five things that you could change so you know pull down and it would give him a new board but he would write so fast that even with a typing um typing as fast as you could uh, you had you had a job keeping up with him and then because his writing was really, really bad, you had to keep on asking him what what words were because you couldn't read it. And uh, so he would he would like have to keep on stopping to to tell you what the word was. But history for me was a complete waste of time. Um, learning like that, which is called learning by rote. Um, we know that because I'm a, I'm a teacher myself, so I never do that. I never expect people to learn verbatim. So you write on the board and then they, they copy it down and learn it. The, other, the only other subject that I got into was English. And I started writing um, my own little short stories. And this has sort of sparked me into English. Uh, so I did quite well in English. As a teenager, later on in, in your school life, I was looking at leaving school, uh, and uh, I I will come on to that in a, in the next episode because it's quite interesting. But I, I did I really do believe that the the time away um, in in boarding school 
did not help uh, me at all in my in my life and in my future life because I don't think that being segregated from everybody um, helped me to um, manage relationships and also especially with with family members because you're never there you're only there like maybe a week or two at a time for five or six years and that was all through my teenage years from the age of 11 to 16 um, which is the most important time when when you sort of make bonds the first few years at work you know it was um a growing up process as far as I was concerned because I think when I left school uh, I think that um, being at a special school with so few contacts with outside people you you're about two or three years behind in maturity as far as anybody else is concerned and yet at the same time I was a sort of prisoner on two fronts one mobility and, and two ignorance of what possibilities were and I think that the ignorance of the alternatives was you know caused by the immaturity. I don't think that going to boarding school really helped me. Um, certainly not in the future, because of mainly because of all my all my friends were at school. So when I went back to live in Bristol, I knew nobody. I had very little mobility as well, so I couldn't really get around very well. Um, and I knew nobody because everybody that I knew was at boarding school. And the other thing is that the the, the friends I had it all came up came from all over the UK, so so like my girlfriend at the time was from Birmingham, um, so we would ne we would never meet again after school, that was it that was the end. Of, well, we did meet we did actually meet again because I had a car, but that's not the point. The point is that we couldn't have a relationship after. Down south in Kent, there is the Thomas de la Rue School for older children in the age group thirteen to eighteen. This is a secondary school where only children of good intelligence are admitted. Mr. Davies, the headmaster, is a member of the special panel who interview and select candidates for entry. The children attain a high standard of education. They nearly all know the answer. That's more than I do. Even at the age of 16, treatment has to go on. But of course, Jill didn't get that vital early treatment when she was tiny. On the day the film was made, Peter, who but two years previously was a helpless cripple, discarded his cage for crutches. Another step towards normality. When Pamela was brought to the school, she had been bedridden for 15 years, since birth in fact. And here, only a few months after she arrived, and for the first time in her life, she stands and takes her first lesson in walking. Blowing bubbles helps to direct the breath through the mouth, even if the bubbles do taste horrid. That's much better. Even chewing and sucking sweets is part of the lesson. It helps to coordinate lip and jaw muscles. Recording Mona's voice was essential to ear training as well as for keeping a check on progress. And today's recording shows how much she has improved. enjoyed this um, episode and come back again for another one next time. Bye for now.